Before I start today's show, I just want to give a big shout out to my top tier patron at Patreon, Aileen Sandoval. Without your help, Aileen, and without all the other help of my wonderful patrons, this show wouldn't be possible. And I also want to let you know that you too can become a patron of this show, Math Science History. Come on over to patreon.com slash math science history, sign up for a tier, and you can get all kinds of benefits as well as knowing that you've done something to contribute to not only the arts and not only history, but also to the inspiration and encouragement of math and science. So come on over, patreon.com slash math science history. And on with the show. Oh, and also, before I begin my show on Women's History Month, I want to note that when I mention women in science, I'm talking about women of all races, from all countries, and I'm also talking about transgender women in science who greatly inspire other women and trans women to take up this wonderful world of discovery. Ladies, you are all amazing. It's an honor to be among you. Okay, now on with the show. Between the 16th and 17th centuries, there was a slow development of women in science. However, Europe experienced a considerable increase of women in science by the 18th century, significantly in Italy, France, Germany, Britain, Sweden, Switzerland, America, China, and the Netherlands. Although I know China's not in Europe, but still, I want to include them. As a result, after the 18th century, as the world entered an age of the Industrial Revolution, the French Revolution, and the new imperialism, women had established a small foothold in science. Regardless, they still did not stand on equal footing with their male counterparts. On the contrary, women were still significantly outnumbered by men in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics (STEM), just as they are today. Something occurred across Europe that encouraged women to read, question, and debate the study of science. Women were inspired by science. So, what happened within the 18th century that set women up for success and presented opportunities for them? Especially since, though some men, some men did advocate for women's education, women still encountered overt dissonance from the male community. In 18th century Europe, there was an increase in women entering the field of science, more so than in the 17th century. Maybe, maybe it started with the printing press and the mass production of books. Possibly, it was the Enlightenment and its influence on empirical thought. How did women make so much progress despite the opposition from a society that believed that women should be at home and not gathering to discuss science? The answer is that they proved that there was power in numbers, they began to gather. It was the gathering of women for intellectual conversation in cafes, homes, salons, and boudoirs, where all women were invited, regardless of class or aristocracy. Thus, across Europe, there was a significant uptick in the attendance of women involved in the studies and observation of astronomy, anatomy, mathematics, physics, biology, and other academic fields. Women who met in these scholarly gatherings found scientific inspiration during the 18th century. They were empowered, and through their meetings, they realized that they had human rights, academic rights, and the right to be part of empirical science. Moreover, though they faced backlash for their efforts to educate themselves, they found strength and valor through their gatherings. So what started this movement in the 18th century? Did it just occur in the 18th century? Or were there factors behind this development? We can answer these questions by looking at the 16th and 17th centuries across Europe. 
In the 16th century, in 1543, Nicholas Copernicus published his work On the Revolutions on the Celestial Spheres, which shook the Aristotelian foundations of Catholicism. Then, in 1616, the Catholic Church claimed heliocentrism to be heretical. As noted in my previous shows, with the advanced developments in the telescope in the early 17th century, Galileo discovered that the Earth is not the center of the universe and stated so in his published work, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. I mentioned this in a previous show. Empirical science began to challenge the authority of the Catholic Church, which had a foothold in academia. In the late 17th and early 18th century, John Locke published Essay Concerning Human Understanding, and David Hume published A Treatise of Human Nature. These works stirred the empirical movement. Men were meeting in cafes, pubs, and homes for discussions on politics, science, literature, and art. Women were inspired by this and began to form their own gatherings for similar discussions. Between watching the men gather and watching the church waver under the influence of empiricism, women viewed the usurping force of empirical science as an opportunity to pursue scholarship without the fear of the church's authority. Possibly empiricism inspired them to progress in science through their gatherings and discussions on science. Thus, they often saw attendance at the debating societies as well. Even so, they were met with conflict and insults because they wanted to debate with the men. Historian Mary Thale points out that in the 1752 Drury Lane Journal, journalists noted these mixed gathering debates even when women were admitted, men saw their presence at these debates as an incursion. Yeah. Even so, this did not dissuade 18th century women. They began to recognize that they had human rights and inserted themselves in male-dominated science by building personal laboratories, exhibiting their works, and pushing their discoveries, even though the realms of discovery at that time were socially reserved only for men. The two areas of Europe that perpetuated the movement for women in science were Italy and France. In Italy, Maria Gaetana Agnesi and Laura Bassi obtained doctorates and positions within the university. These two women became the focal point of Italian academia. For Agnesi, Pope Benedict XIV offered her the honorary chair in natural philosophy and mathematics at the University of Bologna in 1750. In 1731, 20 years earlier, at 20 years old, Bassi was the first woman in Europe granted a degree in science and the first woman to become a professor in an Italian university. If you're interested, you can learn more about Bassi in my podcast from Season 1, Episode 4. So just look that one up, Laura Bassi, Gabrielle Burchak, easy to find. Anyhow, back to the story. In France, mathematician Gabrielle Emilie de Letonia de Boutet, Marquise du Châtelet, also known as Gabrielle Emily du Châtelet, wrote six works. Her story is somewhat unique, even today. She had multiple lovers, including Voltaire good for her. And she loved to gamble. Yeah. But she also loved mathematics. Gabrielle published her first work, Essay on Nature and Spread of Fire, in 1737. Then, in 1740, she published Physical Institutions. Within two years of its publication, this work had been copied, translated into multiple languages, and distributed beyond Europe. The book looked at the physics and the mechanics of Newtonian physics. It was groundbreaking and created a debate within the science community as many, many people were endeavoring to understand Newtonian physics. She also wrote a French translation and commentary on Isaac Newton's Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, which at that time was the foundation to understanding the fundamental laws of physics. However, in 1749, at the age of 42, shortly after giving birth, she died before she had a chance to publish it. 
Nevertheless, this work was published posthumously in 1756, and it became the standard work on physics for France. Also, after her death, Denis Diderot and Jean Leron de Lambert wrote about her philosophies, mathematics, and scientific writings in their work known as Encyclopédie. As a result, Du Châtelet, even after her death, inspired multiple women to venture into the world of math and science. Then, around 1760, while Italy was presenting thinking women as anomalies in the world of academia, women in France opened their home salons for other women to meet and discuss the sciences. These salons became a forum for educated French women to converse on many topics, including mathematics, physics, politics, philosophy, botany, and medicine. Though many of these affluent women were patrons of the salons, these gatherings didn't marginalize other women. Uneducated women who were not aristocrats could also attend and discuss the ideas of the Enlightenment. Soon, many of these gatherings were taking place across Britain. Some prominent women at these gatherings included the first British female historian, Catherine Macaulay, whose prominent book, Letters on Education, impacted education. In her book, Macaulay appealed to the development of public education through the support of taxes, stating it was, quote, for all the subordinate classes of citizens, unquote. Macaulay, along with several other women, became founding members of the Blue Stocking Society. The society encouraged other gatherings among women across Britain. Furthermore, the writings of Macaulay served as an inspiration to the author Mary Wollstonecraft, who in 1792 published her work, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Wollstonecraft was the mother of Mary Shelley, the infamous author who wrote Frankenstein, one of my favorite books, right up there with Dracula. As a result, in the 18th century, the foundations of inspiration for women in science had been set. Though women were still not allowed into the laboratories and the universities, they took up significant interest in all areas of science, including natural science, botany, physics, mathematics, and medicine. They wouldn't just hold gallery events that would display their specimens and knowledge, they wrote books. They encouraged the schools to let young girls attend and learn the value of science, literature, mathematics, and socializing. These women didn't just dabble. They immersed themselves in science. Even so, they were still derided and insulted as these women forced their entrance into the world of science. Because they were viewed as infringing on a men's world, there was so much resistance to letting women in academia and science. It wasn't until 1742 that Countess Benigna von Zizendorf established the first all-girls school in the United States. In 1764, Catherine the Great of Russia established institutions to allow girls to receive advanced education. In 1788, she established public education for elementary and high school girls. In 1787, Sweden and Denmark established universities that allowed women to go to school. In the 18th century, women found inspiration. America had horticulturalist Martha Daniel Logan, biologist Jane Colden, and inventor Catherine Green. Antigua had Lydia Byam, who is a naturalist in Britain. Historian Catherine Macaulay wrote about the history of science. Also, chemist Elizabeth Fulhaime established a foothold in science in 1794. In China, and I know it's not Europe, but I want to include China, Wang Zhenyi established herself as an astronomer in 1788. France brought us botanist Catherine Jeremy, anatomist Marie Marguerite Bayeron, and chemist Marie Lavoisier, and mathematicians Sophie Germain and Marie Anne Pigeon. In Germany, Christine and Margarita Kirch flourished in astronomy in 1716. In Italy, Christina Roccati was known for her accomplishments in physics. Anna Morandi Manzolini was known for her work in medicine, and Maria Ardinghelli was known for her mathematics. 
That's a great story too. In Spain, Maria Andrea Cassia Mayer became known for her knowledge of mathematics as early as 1720. In 1771, Maria Cristina Brun flourished as an inventor and Elsa Beata Bunch succeeded as a botanist in Sweden. In Switzerland, Anna Barbara Reinhardt established herself in the world of mathematics. And in 1785, Jacoba van den Brand established the first all-female science academy in the Netherlands. Though this list is long, it's not long enough. And in this episode, I have only mentioned several women. There are so many more from the 18th century who are worth noting, who immersed themselves in science and inspired other women to join the wonderful world of discovery. That said, I'm going to post a spreadsheet on my website at mathsciencehistory.com, which will list all the women in the 18th century that I have currently researched who made a big impact in the world of science in the 18th century. These women inspired other women. Germany's Dorothea Erxelben even wrote about her inspirations. She had sent letters to Laura Bassi in Italy telling her of her adoration for women in science, especially Bassi. Soon, one by one, women began to tread the trail for other women in science. That trail turned into a path that has now become a well-paved freeway that invites women from every country, every race, and every prior gender to join the world of science but it's not enough. According to the International Labor Organization and data gathered by Magdalena Smizgiera, in the country of Georgia, women encompass 56% of the STEM-based workforce. In the United States, 48% of the STEM-based workforce includes women. In the United Kingdom, women encompass 40% of the STEM-based workforce. In Austria, the percentage of women working in STEM is 35%. Furthermore, the top five countries that employ women in STEM include Mongolia, Kiribati, Dominican Republic, and Cambodia. Though these numbers look promising, we still need more women in STEM. In Niger, only 10% of the STEM-based workforce includes women. Additionally, among 110 countries, only 30% of female students choose to study STEM in higher education. Furthermore, According to the National Science Foundation, only 34% of women work in the STEM workforce globally. Thus, there is no one-to-one -one ratio between women and men in science. But I'm optimistic, and I believe that these numbers will continue to grow. We have our struggles, and sometimes we fall out of the pipeline. I've been there. However, the doors will only be open as long as we keep them open and as long as we continue to gather. Because when women in STEM gather, we share our most powerful attribute, which is knowledge. We empower, we inspire, and we motivate. Our history is rich with stimulating stories about women who have changed the world and have shown the world that when we gather, the world changes. That's not just the power of math, science, and history. That is the power of women. Until next time. Carpe diem. Thanks for watching Math Science History. If you're interested in the spreadsheet that I mentioned and in the transcripts, come on over to mathsciencehistory.com. Also, I do have a podcast. It reflects this show. You can always find that podcast on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Just look them up and Google Math Science History with Gabrielle Burchek and ta-da, there I am. And Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, carpe diem.